Well, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to the first of what we hope will be a long and exciting series of talks uh, sponsored by the Center for Computational Biology and directed at the issues that are going to arise from the $1,000 personal human genome sequence. Whether it's here this year or next year is unclear, but what is clear is that it is coming and we won't be fully prepared for it. And this series of talks is designed to help us sort of understand how leaders in industry are uh, positioning themselves to be able to help interpret the information, to gain the information, to deliver value on that information. Uh, before we get going, though, I'd like to uh, make a couple of announcements. First of all, I want to thank Solera Corporation for their generous support of the activities of the Center for Computational Biology, so thank you very much for that. And I also want to thank three really very key people, uh, Brian McClendon from the Center, uh, Shail Kumar and Deborah Jacob for, for many things, including organizing and inspiring this seminar series for helping us develop the uh, the uh, industrial affiliates program for the Center for Computational Biology, and almost least the uh, wonderful reception that we have planned for you um, after this talk today. And I should note that uh, the next speaker in the series will be Ann Wojcicki from uh, the founder of 23andMe, and she'll be here in the same room at the same time on uh, April 8th, so we'll have a chance to see other activities in this area. Uh, now, I have never had the pleasure of introducing anybody whose career path is so interesting and so varied as Dr. Alain Rappaport, who received his Doctor of Molecular Pharmacology at uh, Marie Curie University, and then a medical degree from Ray Descartes University, both in, in Paris, and then took what has to be one of the more unusual moves for someone with biomedical and, and medical training, and did a postdoctoral fellow in the Robotics Institute at the School of Computer Science in Carnegie Mellon University. So we know right off the bat, this is a very interesting fellow, uh, where he then was a, first a postdoctoral fellow and then an adjunct faculty member. Uh, he's done many things during his career. For example, from 1997 to 1999, he was a senior advisor to NASA uh, in Mountain View. He was a founding member of the Innovative Applications of Artificial Intelligence Conference, and I understand that artificial intelligence is not what I experience when I give undergraduate exams, but it's something more rigorous than that. Uh, he was the co-founder and president and chief scientist of Neuron Data, one of the first companies to use artificial, application, uh, app artificial intelligence applications to healthcare. And uh, more recently, he was the founder and CEO of MedStory, one of the very innovative companies, probably the leader, in trying to think about how we use personal genetic and genomic information to deliver intelligent decisions uh, on healthcare. And uh, just recently, last year, they acquired Microsoft or maybe I've got that backwards. Uh, but in either condition, there is now a joint program between uh, the, the activities of uh, MedStory and Microsoft. Microsoft has, of course, been an active participant in many collaborations on campus, notably through the Rad Lab and through LBNL. And uh, we hope this is the first of a long series of interactions of people from Microsoft with those of us interested in the genetic and gen genomic aspects of, of human biology and its applications to healthcare. So Alon, thank you very much for coming and welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction and the, the invitation to talk here. Um, it, it's really a pleasure to address this crowd. I'm going to um, just make sure I tell you first, MedStory is part of Microsoft. We were acquired last year. So um, the group uh, I'm running is called Health Search, and we're based in Mountain View on the Microsoft campus. Uh, today, I wanted to give you a perspective on what is it we're really doing at Microsoft in, in healthcare? Maybe not the full scope, but um, what pertains to um, personalized medicine and information that goes to people, consumers, patients, um, rather than the enterprise side, which is another thing we are focusing on, and give you a sense of um, how the infrastructure we are putting together as well as some of the tools we are putting together are there to, to really interact with other players in the industry and bring personalized medicine to, to reality as it's moving um, really fast right now. So my first slide is just to tell you what our mission is, is to improve health and to do that around the world. It's a pretty big mission, of course, but um, let me tell you one or two elements about it. First, um, this is the only vertical in terms of industry that Microsoft is going into. It hasn't been uh, in the history of the company to go after specific verticals and build solutions. So this is the first one. There, um, there are several reasons for this. It's a very big one with a lot of unmet needs. And it's also one that is heavily underserved 
in terms of information technology. Um, so it's a really exciting one to go and participate in, and particularly with the view that I'm going to try to describe to you, which is you know, not to be um, kind of a, uh, not just building solutions that compete with people but, and, and others, but really building a platform that allows others to come and participate more actively into uh, um, healthcare IT. So with that, um, I'll also just add that we're really interested in outcomes, in, in creating solutions that change outcomes for the better in healthcare. And, and it's a key measure for us of, of success is whether or not people do live better lives. So I'll start with some of the fundamentals. Basically, we're observing a Copernican shift, as we call it in healthcare right now. Whereas healthcare used to be driven only by the professionals or the institutions that were providing the care. And this is completely shifting to empower the consumer. And I'm going to be using this term as a generic term for just you know, people or consumers or patients, or, but anyone that is actually um, uh, interacting with, with health as, as people. So this shift is to, I'm going to try the laser here, is to have I'm going to try it here. OK, I'm not getting the laser right, but it's to have the consumer at the center of the picture. OK, that one. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. To have the consumer at the center of the picture um, with uh, the, their demand, their interest, and their I they're being able to manage information much more proactively, driving the whole healthcare system. So you see that you know, people are interested now in home prevention, in managing data about themselves, about on chronic care. They want to interact and have much more say in um, their hospital stays or outpatient situations, and et cetera. So we're observing this and uh, want to enable this revolution to take place. So right now, if you are a person and you're interacting with the healthcare system, you basically um, are facing a very dislocated uh, set of players that don't talk to one another and talk to you in different ways. You interact, you have to interact with silos of information that have to do with your prescriptions, um, with the hospital, with the providers, health plans, consu consumer products, your employers. It's a very complex space. And one of the key missions that we have is really to see how can we help put all these things together. We need to aggregate these data silos so that communication happens between the different sources. And from there, you create value. It's an extraordinary complicated industry. Um, we see the consumer as the next aggregator of information. In the past, the aggregators of information were the only people who had information, which were the professionals, providers, health plans, and so on. Increasingly, each of you is getting much, much more information about their own health and how to manage it. So we are seeing the consumer as the aggregators who want to interact with all these different institutions or sources of information here in healthcare. Again, like the hospital networks and physicians test labs, etc., but also acquire information through devices, um, like you know, whether it is a device that's capturing some key data related to a chronic disease or a more lifestyle-oriented data, like your pedometer when you're running. You become the owner of a lot more information. To go fast, and we'll go about this, we'll, we'll, we'll go um, in more details here. I think that it's not just only the aggregators, it's that we're at a kind of juncture right now where the consumer is going to acquire information that's very sophisticated ahead of the healthcare system itself. That's what's happening with personal genomics and the ability, for example, to deliver to you your, if not yet your entire $1,000 genome, at least you know, the data on the chip that has uh, 500,000 or 1,000 SNPs on it and tells you a profile for which there is not even a data representation in the hospital systems, but you get it even before they do. It's giving you an idea of how the empowerment is happening and we need to address it and make it a very uh, meaningful 
thing to get this information and use it. So we're looking at how health devices are going to um, help with this, but also how people are going to build applications that are merging all this information and creating the necessary mashups to actually, again, create value, get back to the system, and, um, uh, and drive your own healthcare. So towards this, um, we've been, and this is what you saw in the first slide, we've been um, introducing a platform called Health Vault. It was introduced last October. It's really what we call here a platform for innovation and connectivity between consumers and their health information. So the key to this is that we want to be, enable people to have a, a, a place in, in the overall infrastructure where they just go, to the web, they go through the web, get there, and in there they can put together and acquire information about their own health or the health of people that um, uh, they care about. So this is represented by this little folder at the center. Now, what do people do now, nowadays in healthcare when, they have an, when, you know, when, when something happens, when they have an event of interest? Basically, they start on the internet and they search. So search is a key function where people acquire information and try to distill uh, and understand and act on that data. So it's important for us to provide a search aspect, which is really has become the starting point. It's also important for this space to interact with other websites and health devices, information from your health plan, but also from doctors, get data from prescriptions. There's a lot that needs to kind of like be put together and connected so this becomes meaningful. That's kind of the, the central concept of, of the Microsoft Health Vault, which is out. So before I forget to say it, www.healthvault.com. You can not only see what it is, but you can download the SDK, the Software Development Kit, and start building applications. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So we've put, it's important to, to, to tell you these things because they are really critical in uh, building the next infrastructure for, for consumers and patients. We've put certain principles forward that we are absolutely adamant about. The number one, is privacy and security focus. So everything that's going to exist on Health Vault and all of the interactions that I'm going to be talking about and searches are going to be based on permission by the user. You really own your information. It's totally private. You could have no one look at it or just exactly which person you want to share it with and share what part of information. So really, piece by piece, every piece of data is either authorized or not authorized to be shared with specific people. Privacy is very key, and you know, we could have a whole talk about this one, but I want to put it forward as number one here. The second one is we know we are going to acquire, people are going to want to acquire a ton of information from a variety of sources. Um, we're not about building industry standards for what this information should look like or that one, but really be inclusive of what the standards are. And at the same time, we are working on how to put together models for data, um, like some of the interactions we have right now with the, the major players in the genomics space, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, we're looking at you know, how one has a particular model for SNPs and another one has another one, and how can they communicate with one another, and can we have an infrastructure and a model, if you like, that helps um, merging this information and make it, making it usable. And the third one, it's all free for users. So for anyone to go and create that, that their space in Health Vault or their Health Vault, um, it is free, but it's also free for developers to, try to build applications against that data. Um, and uh, that's a very important principle as well. So going forward, let me tell you a little bit more about Health Vault in terms of this slide is about what it is not. It is not a personal health record or not an electronic medical record. It's really a space, so we use this little metaphor. This is actually a little vault with a computer coming out of it. And um, what we're showing you here is that the idea is that if you have your personal health record somewhere or an electronic medical record, 
you want to be able to connect to them and pull in the information that you deem pertinent that you're going to be using. Vice versa, you might be pushing out information that you are capturing yourself and you know, send it to applications that help you deal, for example, with a chronic condition or with, with wellness issues. So it really is a, a space where all this type of information, some of it very ill-structured, some of it just documents, other very structured, can be put together and exploited by applications that people are going to build or companies or institutions. This, these little buttons at the bottom show you that when you build an app, you can, you can copy from HealthVault. So for example, if I'm capturing data from a glucometer or a pedometer or any kind of device, um, it can go straight to, the, um, to a hospital or to some other application that uh, connects it with some function. Or it can be automatically synced. This is kind of a real-time function here. Or I can get data from somewhere else and copy it into my vault. So it's really about moving the information um, as deemed necessary. So I'm back to this picture I showed earlier of this, these you know, very complex kind of institutionalized players that we have to work with and pieces of industry. And so the picture, once we put the health vault together, get this one, looks more like this. She's a little illustration here that's very busy, but it's showing you precisely this is my health vault or yours. And you have all these applications that interact through these APIs to gather information, to move information from the different services that exist out there. Whether it's, again, your prescriptions, uh, information from, uh, that's pertinent to your employer or physicians, hospital consumers. It's all about getting it in there and getting it to move out and, and start enriching these uh, information silos. This is a pretty important slide, actually, because what it shows you is that the consumer is going to acquire information all the time, and this information is more and more pertinent to how they, to, to basically their therapeutic or fitness strategies. So you really become, over time, the owner of more valuable information almost than there is in the various parts that you're interacting with. It's a, it's a good, interesting case of the sum is, is bigger than the, or the whole is bigger than the, the sum of, of the pieces. And then there's this little helicopter that's hovering in, in various places. It's hard to read, but it says search. Basically, over all these pieces of data, information, documents, and so on, search is absolutely very critical. And we have a strong focus on providing uh, uh, what we call vertical search, what the industry calls vertical search, which is uh, search enabled by knowledge of the domain to um, be more efficient and, and provide relevant information at all times. So we also call this an ecosystem because um, we're building the platform, and players across the industry are going to build these little applications that move the data. Let me give you two examples. Or let me give you one example, and then I'll get to a, a second one, an, an area where uh, there is great value in bringing this kind of uh, power to the, to the consumer, to the patient. And that is um, what we it is people with chronic conditions. You can call this, if, if the first part of my talk, what is pretty easy in it is to understand that you can capture data about yourself that will help you um, live a better life or healthier life and uh, wrap this up in, under the umbrella of primary prevention. This is the big and very costly problem of secondary prevention in healthcare today where a huge part of the cost actually goes. And that is people with chronic conditions who, um, if you look at this chart here, is, is, is an indication of, if you look at the area under the curve, these are crises that are happening in healthcare over time in one individual that may be suffering from, let's say, chronic heart failure or, or other chronic conditions, diabetes. Um, and this, these are very, very costly crises because every time they happen, there's a hospitalization happening and interventions and um, there's also um, definitely an issue of quality of life for the um, 
for the patient. But you see here that before a crisis happens, usually symptoms become worse than normal. In other words, there are signs that things are not going very well. There are signs that, um, that you're heading towards some kind of healthcare crisis. So if you imagine that you do have the devices and the applications that are capturing data that's pertinent to this crisis, you can actually change the picture and move this to a different one where having the information, you actually address the problem earlier and you never go above this threshold where you have hospitalization, extra medications and all the, the extremely costly kind of healthcare crisis issues that are going on. And there's an enormous cost at doing this. So I'm trying to, what I'm trying to relate here is that if uh, my scale, my spirometer, my blood pressure cuff at home, heart rate monitor, glucometer and other devices are constantly capturing data and I can actually store it in a meaningful way and have applications that do analysis on top of this data and inform uh, the key players of what's going on trend-wise with me, I might be able to avert the crisis and manage people's conditions in a very different way. So it really is very interesting um, to see what the outcome would be of properly instrumenting people, literally, with information that they manage, that they capture outside of the healthcare ecosystem itself, just by themselves, and, and um, analyze and get to, to share with the, um, with the physicians. So that's an example that illustrates this, but now I want to get into more of the search aspect of what we do. And the introduction to this is really that patient decision making is increasingly complex nowadays. It's, it's very, very difficult in um, areas like oncology, for example, where you get a lot of information in to make the right decisions. Like you mentioned, I, 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 was a, I kind of started on the AI side at Carnegie Mellon where there's a strong uh, tradition of studying of decision making with Herb Simon and bounded rationality. And we're really in this case where uh, people have very limited resources, yet they have to manage a large amounts of information in order to make decisions. And it's very difficult to maximize everything. What you need to get quickly is you need to get to a satisfying solution, essentially, and move on. And if it doesn't work, iterate. And, but to do this with your health data, people not being MDs and not being you know, obviously experts, it's a very complex challenge. So in this slide, I'm showing you some of the parameters that come into play when uh, patients have to make decisions in an area like, let's say, oncology. Now they have um, genomic profiling that's coming into play. So it's possible to kind of relate um, their, their existing risk to whether, or their genome, if you like, to the level of risk that they have to have an aggressive cancer versus a less aggressive one. All this information is pouring in, and uh, you can see in the literature, just li literally by the day, there are more information on genomic profiling that might affect the way you're going to make a decision. People have social networks. They're very influential. They, try to, they have friends. They have other people who have had the same condition. And they capture this information, and they give it a certain value in the overall equation of decision making. They have their own personal considerations that uh, range they are pretty wide here. Unfortunately, there are also economic decisions and things like this. They have family history, which is sometimes linked to um, risk profiling or their genomic profiles connected with that. This is the clinical presentation that the, their physician is talking about. And there's whether or not clinical guidelines that are said to be very good for everyone are actually good for that one individual. And that's the whole, we enter here this area of understanding risk from cohort studies to one individual, uh, really translating the, the information and its value is a complex task. So people have to deal with all of these kind of factors um, to make decisions. Well, one well-known area, uh, when the BRCA1 gene was, was discovered as being associated with breast cancer, and BRCA2 also with ovarian cancer, you know, it was thought that it would be a really defining moment. In fact, 
when you know you are a carrier, you, it becomes a very complex decision what to actually do from a preventative, way, uh, uh, from a pre preventative perspective or, um, or if you do have uh, breast cancer already from a therapeutic strategy perspective. So entering all these factors is complicated and people want to get educated. So what they will do is they will do search and they will um, want to understand the domain um, that they need to understand, whether it's for themselves or for a loved one. And that means they will want search that, so maybe the, it's not perfect rendering with this definition, but I want to talk to you a bit more about health vault search and how it is different. Uh, we've put together a search platform, if you like, that um, doesn't just give you results when it's looking at the world of documents, whether it's those of a, of a sp for specific institutions or, those, or the whole World Wide Web, but is one that gives you a landscape of the issue at hand and allows you to understand very quickly what are the elements that are at play relative to your query. I'm going to show you more of this, but this is what we call, and I'll use the terminology, the dashboard of information. It's basically the idea is to extract this information and present it to the user so they have like beacons to know how to navigate, drill down and understand what are the elements of the domain before they even start reading, opening a document and read it. The other thing that we want to associate with search that's very connected to the platform I was talking about earlier is that they want to do it in privacy. They want to also be able to store and they want to not just find documents, they want to find applications that people have done that will help them manage their lives or situations. So if someone builds an application that's a, like showing here a little um, body mass index calculator or some, some disease risk calculator or, or other, you want to be able to find these things, save them in your own space and use them for your own guidance and, and health management. So we're looking at um, building systems that are smart enough to understand the domain for you and building an infrastructure that can keep the information that you find so that you're not just on the web, but you're actually then learning and acting. I'm going to show you a bit more of this. So there's a bit of contrast on the uh, projection here, but this is, a, this is a basic consumer search um, in health. You see the query is on hypertension. And it highlights right away, you know, what are conditions that are connected to hypertension, like obesity and stroke here. What are the, some key drugs and substances, some alternative medicine. Um, and uh, it highlights right away for you, you I can't scroll here because we're not live, but, you know, a good document from uh, an authoritative source like Mayo Clinic, so you can quickly understand and be reading. And then it get, takes you to the places on the web that have uh, higher quality content where, again, you can understand and educate yourself very quickly. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about how, how this works, how we do this, but um, the key concept is, is really here, is that we need to build systems in search that are smart enough to bridge the gap of knowledge between the domain that people are trying to get into and their own knowledge, which is usually minimal, particularly in healthcare, because it's just too complex for most people. So with this illustration, I move to the next one. Now, this is just an extension. If I go back to that slide, you see this, what I call the dashboard here, pertinent information that I can read, understand right away and use. If I say, show me more refinements, I get a bigger such dashboard. Let me tell you how we generate this quickly in terms of um, what's unique about the, the, the proposition. We actually maintain on the side of, this, of uh, other sources, separate from other sources, we, separate, we, we create our own index of the medical literature and other authoritative sources where clinical studies and cohort studies and other things go. It's updated every day or several times a day. And it's by mining and analyzing that space that's has only authoritative information that we come up with this li literally search within a search here that shows you what are the important drugs, what are the important personal health issues 
connected to your query, regardless of the query. So this is kind of the key to the MetaStory technology and what we're doing with HealthVault Search right now. It's this ability to extract the proper knowledge. And once you have it, you can do a lot of things with it. You can, for example, say, um, you know, I'm going to use it to drill down. I want to understand what's the relationship between you know, diabetes and obesity. But, and then click on this and just start drilling down. People without knowledge wouldn't know where to go in that space. Now, however, I'm showing you this slide to show you that by doing so, you can really capture disease complexity. And, and that's really important. Why? Because a query on diabetes here, I've just highlighted, I need to get a bit of contrast definition here, but if you see what's highlighted here, it's all cardiovascular. And that's, that's really very important in this type of search. We're in diabetes, the query is diabetes, but a good portion of the answers are in cardiovascular issues. And why? Because people don't die of diabetes, they die of all the things that they do to, as the mismanagement of the complications or all of the other issues that are tied to their diabetes. So it's really important to build systems that surface the complexity of the knowledge and the issues rather um, than do the simplistic view of saying, well, diabetes is managing your blood sugar. It's actually a much, much more complex issue and um, we take it as an objective to be able to surface that complexity and show it to, to uh, the individuals that do search and want to learn by doing search. So there's a lot of complex trait diseases like this where you need an incredible amount of knowledge from the user to actually make those connections if you don't make them for themselves, for, if you don't make them for them. So it's really about searching and learning. I'm going to show you quickly Another example, kind of another twist on this search. Um, this is a query on breast cancer stage two. I better tell it to you because I'm sure you can't read it from there. And we're just highlighting here that here, here are conditions that are connected to it, like in invasive ductal carcinoma and other subtypes, personal health issues connected to that. Here are drugs and substances. And you see my first drugs are cytoxan, tamoxifen, doxorubicin and herceptin. Now herceptin is well known as one of the first missile guided drugs in terms of personalized medicine as it turns out. But, um, and here are a number of results from the NCI that are pertaining to this. Now if I just change my search to a breast cancer stage four, in this little search that's happening throughout that uh, body of, of literature and authoritative sources, you see that Herceptin comes to the top, which is indeed where it is the most important in terms of therapeutic value in, in the stage four. So it's really about kind of like um, searching the domain of medicine and capturing the information and ranking the information so that you get the most important pieces at the top for um, very specific topics that you might be addressing. And then, of course, there are changes that are adequate to the query in terms of what web results you obtain here. But it's also about acting. So there should be little arrows at the end here. This is the same breast cancer stage four query. Um, you can save these drugs and you, you, this understanding the system has and put it in your scrapbook. So the scrapbook is back to Health Vault that's in that space where Maybe the data will get connected and searched against other information you have in your own private space. This guideline from the, the National Cancer Institute might also be brought in here. And on the right side, you know that's an advertising rail, someone might have a very interesting tool uh, that helps you determine, you know, like whether or not you should have this, you should take this therapeutic strategy and have a little tool that estimates your risk based on data or, or molecular test as, are, as you know are starting to appear that allow you to make decisions based on uh, more like um, uh, rather than germinal mutations, somatic mutations that are picked up on, on tumors. So if, we, if the search is successful, you'll get not only information here, you'll get tools here that, will, that you can save and that help you analyze um, your risk 
or help you be more informed in making decisions with your physicians, as well as keep the key knowledge that's related to uh, uh, your interest. So that's why we call it uh, search, learn, and act. Now, in here, I just give you another example of search. So let's say now you can get, you're going to have talks on that. Um, you know, companies that are building chips and give you your SNPs. So here is an example where here is your SNP delivered by one of those you know, chips. And uh, again, it might be hard to read, but I just entered in the search a, um, the reference number of one single nucleotide polymorphism in here, RS7903146. And you do come up with a dashboard that tells you, oh, that relates, that, that gets you connected to type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. And you can, uh, uh, there are connections to genotyping and to your body mass index. And then I can just click on insulin resistance and say, okay, tell me what's the connection between this and that and start learning. So we're also really interested in allowing people not just to, to do you know, the high level searches, but some very specific searches and translating information that's really very obscure into usable, actionable um, pieces of content or results or studies. And, and this takes you, in this case, right away to some of the key studies in terms of this SNP on the TCF7L2 um, gene. That's just the beginning, of course, because you know how big the growing omics are, thanks to uh, the work of a lot of you here. You know, people will be looking at haplotypes, at their CNVs, DNA methylation, the methylome, all these things are coming up. And um, it's possible that consumers get this information before actually physicians do. And they, they might come up because they'll just have access to the, you know, the high throughput information at a very low cost, again towards the $1,000 genome. Um, you show up with your genome, that's a serious challenge for the, uh, um, for the physician and the healthcare institutions. I added protein-protein interaction networks because who knows, that might also become a marker. So let me give you a quick example of what I call deep search. And this is just uh, um, to illustrate this. Now, this one is like really hard to read. So you're very good if you can read any of this. But um, even for me, it's not easy from here. Uh, this is a search that we did on the MedStory site. So we're, we're keeping this lab site, uh, the, the medstory.com site, where um, you can do this type of, this is the same technology that powers HealthVault. I did a search on the gene MLH1. And right in here, whereas before I showed you more consumer-oriented type information that was brought up in the dashboard, this one will actually uh, come up with the molecular biology that's relevant to MLH1 with, with rankings. You can see some of the rankings here on the um, diseases. So it's almost like you know, doing instant translation of a gene into the, the um, phenotypes or conditions that, that might be relevant and in order. And here, it's about the other genes that are actually connected to it somehow. So I'm finding out right away that MLH1 is, is linked to um, MSH2. I can click on here and say, why don't you do a search on both of them so I understand how they're connected. So this is really navigating much deeper type molecular, bi molecular biology information. And when I do that, I would get to a next page, which is just shown as a, you know, something showing up on top here. Um, and the, here's another dashboard. 5-FU, which is you know, a therapeutic agent in oncology, is still relevant to those two genes. Tell me how so. You click in here and you get the information there. This is kind of an example of a deep dive and of how we can like cut across all types of categories of information and uh, use an intelligent way of navigating them and highlighting what, um, what's important or what may be of interest. So back to consumer genetics. We're really excited about people in the industry building applications that will connect HealthVault to the type of um, new added value they're building in that space. I'm just showing you some areas of partners we are talking to. Of course, disease screening, just disease risk as established by um, some genomic profile. Pharmacogenomics, 
companies and tests are very interesting and very important type of early genomic data that you would want to bring in and then connect this to what? Of course, to um, other applications that might be dealing with drug interactions with uh, optimal dosage and, and, and a lot of other apps like this. There are companies doing paternity and family relationship type um, studies that want to bring information into HealthVault as well. Other areas of full genome sequencing, like you mentioned earlier. Therapeutic screening, those are more like uh, tests for establishing therapeutic strategies. And of course, all of the genomic um, tests that have to do with more like guidance in, in lifestyle, like, uh, you know, you shouldn't eat that type of things too much because you have this SNP somewhere. But all of this information become actually really interestingly connected. It's possible that in your lifestyle guidance is something that will interact with a pharmacogenomic restriction that you have for a particular therapy. So again, if we didn't put this space together here where these applications can connect with one another and someone can build an application that will connect lifestyle to pharmacogenomics, these things just won't happen. It's really about enabling the ecosystem. So I've put together a little complicated slide here, but th there should be arrows. Somehow it's the optics are not showing you that all of these things are connected by arrows at the end of those lines. But I want to give you a little bit of a scenario of what might happen as we see growing the number of health volts and the, the you know, relationship to um, the genomic space. So certainly, I've talked about the, uh, uploading genomic data into health vault, building applications where there is a model that can capture uh, the information on, on the chip that was used or on the uh, sequence of DNA. But what I have in here on this plane is th several health vaults. So these are people who have their own health vault. For one thing, the fact that they are connected to one another means that they've given permission to one another in their social network to share some piece of information about them, which may help people aggregate around, let's say just for the sake of conversation, around a SNP. People who have the same SNP would like to talk about to each other, identify each other and understand what therapeutic strategy might have been taken relative to this genetic mutation they have or variation. A ton of reasons, but like I said, it's permission-based. So you can, it's not just permission-based with the institutional world, it's permission-based between people. So they can communicate and start sharing information. If they can do this, they will capture not only their genomic information, but they'll start capturing data like metabolic data through some inhaler or some other sensor um, that, that they're using, or you know, just some data that they're capturing again, like when they're running or when they're doing certain activities. That means that it will become possible, but this is the power that these folks have. They become this, the holder of information that might help connect this metabolic data to the genomic data in ways that will allow maybe another application coming maybe from an institution or a company or whatever to start doing association studies based on the fact that you can capture now phenotype, phenotypical and genotypical data um, straight from people. And if, if they want to participate in the study, they might volunteer just that piece of information. So it will enable people to do these association studies, I just call them like this, and generate an analysis at the medical level that will generate in turn a new risk management application that then they can use and live better lives with. And uh, connect this maybe with um, more traditional uh, prescriptions if it's a pharmacogenomics case, but I'm showing you how, of course, everyone's maybe connected to their hospital and have their prescription online. So if they learn new things through this type of research, um, it will affect it will enable new lines of research. It will enable uh, new outcomes and new information to come out. And that's really a part that is very exciting. It's connecting the, the genome to the phenotypes and allow new research to happen. I think it will have an impact also on the adoption of new techniques for um, analyzing and discovering correlations and associations, um, you know, information intensive 
Bayesian types of techniques or, or decision theoretic techniques that are already starting to be applied in patient recruitment for clinical trials and so on. Um, it's certainly a hope that this will create an environment in which a lot of creativity will come in terms of data capture, analysis, and uh, new added value being created for, for, for better lives and better outcomes. And that's why I put this little network together of um, some of the things we anticipate will happen. So in summary, the personalized medicine applications are extremely exciting. And it would be very exciting to see um, people in this group or, or others that you know throughout the industry to start building applications um, that might have to do with pure primary prevention, the molecular um, profiling uh, that helps you with your diet or fitness or wellness are just as valid as uh, molecular profi uh, profiling that's applied to this other region of the spectrum in the acute care um, or the secondary prevention area that I talked about earlier. I think what we see here on the slide in the background, just to illustrate to you, is that of course there are less users here, but from a system standpoint, it's a very big bottleneck, it's a very high cost in healthcare. And the applications are more complex and the user engagement is, 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 is very profound. User engagement is growing here though, also in primary prevention. So we're seeing all this space being very uplifted and I think one area uh, that will be very exciting is those personalized medicine applications. I'll conclude by showing you already, so these are some of the partners that, that we have that are building applications against the HealthWorld platform. And I think we, um, you know, you'll recognize all kinds of, of devices and um, other types of communication applications, prescription applications, capturing data from, uh, from cardiovascular personal devices, etc. And then, of course, connecting these applications together to bring more and more meaningful value is, is what's happening as, uh, as they all um, emerge from this. We know this is a very long journey. We're just at the very beginning. This was launched in October 2007. It's a, it's a big, very complex issue. Uh, there's no one single solution, one single um, company that is going to be able to solve all these problems. But I hope I give you a sense of what kind of contribution we're hoping to make by having this platform approach um, combined with some of the key necessary tools um, like, like a vertical health-oriented search, um, as I described. Finally, I'd like to uh, mention to you that um, we're, we're very excited to have uh, announced recently at the HIMSS conference what we call the Health World Be Well Fund, um, to which if the university has the status, um, or if you know anyone with a 501c3 status, you can apply uh, for funding to build the application on top of HealthVault. And all this information is, is in here, but if you want to learn more or submit proposals, I can give you the summary because it's uh, maybe hard to read. We have a, a $3 million fund there. There's approximately 20 awards averaging about $150,000 we're expecting to see with a maximum of, of half a million for any single award. Um, it has to be a 501c3 nonprofit status um, organization and the proposals have to be in by May 9th. And again, if you go to healthvault.com slash fund, you can find all this information. So it'd be great to have uh, people in this crowd or in your um, professional or social network interested in participating. That, that, uh, that's fantastic. So that's it. Thank you very much for <laughs> your attention. And in this general sector where computation and biology interfaces, what are the missing skill sets that you see among people that you have a chance to consider hiring? The missing skill sets or the skills? The skills that are most needed are the ones that are hardest to find. Um, you know, the, the, 
what's interesting is we are really about the vertical. So understanding or having one thing that I would say definitely characterizes the, the, the people that um, are working in the health solutions group is a deep interest in healthcare from one reason or another, uh, sometimes professional or sometimes of other nature that has led them to be extremely interested. Now that's, that's, that said, a lot of people are interested in healthcare. But an understanding and a willingness to work in this domain is very critical because we are, it's very vertical. You see what I mean? We're very focused on, on healthcare on the healthcare dimension. Um, uh, that said, also, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting um, backgrounds in the group or in my group, for example, typically that uh, might have gone uh, to do computational chemistry at Berkeley or uh, computer science at Stanford and then go to a genomics company and then, and then, and then be in the group. I think um, an understanding of uh, what it means and an understanding and an interest in the translation as well into actual, you know, actionable information of what people do is what characterizes a lot the, the, the folks that we have. In other words, not just designing algorithms for algorithms, but you know, looking quickly at their, at their impact and what do they translate into. Um, those are the types of background. Uh, hi, I have a two-part question. Um, it seems that uh, making correct choices um, is, is a major factor in people's health care, um, you know, regardless of the, the genetic component for a lot of people. Um, so the first part is, is uh, how do you see this long term as far as focusing on, on making sense of this complex issue to help people, you know, wade through all the, all the data. And then the second part related to that is, you mentioned Herbert uh, Simon. I'm wondering you know, uh, what the key ideas there you think are and, and, and what other key ideas might be related to the decision-making issues. Um, <clears throat> to part one of your question, I would say that um, you know, it's, it's going to be about people in the ecosystem innovating. It's, that's kind of like, um, back to my statement, and there is not one company that's going to understand this. I think people will build sometimes very small, very precise applications that have a ton of value because they um, reduce the complexity of some data into actionable information. And we don't know what, what those are. We're, we're really about, I mean, we, we have a focus on the search side that's, that's very important. Um, but that said, about those applications and those actionable um, pieces of information, we want to enable people to, to build them, innovate, and, and um, uh, generate new value in that, in that complex chain you're describing. And the second one, uh, you know, I was just mentioning that I think uh, we're I'm not evading your question here. I think we're just at the very beginning, just like we're at the beginning of the empowerment of the patient. There will be a ton of interest on in how decisions are made, indeed. And it might be very different from um, some of the early theories that are more focused on economics and uh, because of uh, the nature of healthcare itself. But that's one direction that I think will be um, very interesting to observe, and it, it will be dependent on the first part of, the, of your question. I mean, the two are very correlated. If you, as people build new tools um, and that contribute to decision making, we'll understand better how decision making happens. But it's really um, uh, patient decision making is becoming far more important, and that's the Copernican revolution relative to what it was even five or ten years ago. Thank you. I have a non-scientific question. What is your um, business model, uh, basically, with this um, tool and the whole uh, database? Um, in other words, you know, what are, are is this going to be an advertisement-based revenue model? And if that's the case, how um, do you ensure patients would actually trust the information provided? 
Um, <coughs> the, the business model of, of search is advertising based. I mean, that's a, that's a well known one. Um, your question, the, the, the second part is, is how do we ensure that the patient will trust who is advertising? I think um, that this type of infra infrastructure we're putting together and, and openness is going to be um, a pretty major force in increasing the transparency of advertisers in healthcare. Because um, by putting the, the data into the hands of people and have them manage much more of their health, uh, they will be far more discerning than, if you are, than, than they are right now. So even if I'm talking here about a phenomenon, I think it's going to be a very important part of, of what happens. You will have more transparency because the tools are becoming sharper at finding what is really the relevant information. Is it, are you really advertising or offering your services, let's say, in context, or are you out of context? You see what I mean? So by being much more targeted, it's putting pressure on people to do actually things that are meaningful and come up in the right context. And um, I think that's going to be a very important force. So I'd like to move the discussion, if you could, up to the reception, and thank you. Thank you very much.